Good morning. It's a pleasure to speak to you today about the first death of Parthian. I have to apologize that I can't be there with you, but teaching duties and uh, a young family, I'm afraid, have precluded me from actually traveling to Yerevan as much as I love the city. Without further ado then, to the presentation. If you would like to follow this presentation on your own computer or download it for later reference, please go to the address given at the bottom of the first slide. Now, this is a talk very much dealing with the history of language and historical linguistics. And in order to give you a good overview of the situations, we will have to deal with certain aspects of Parthian history and the attestation of the Parthian language first. So to begin with, we'll talk about the two eras of Parthian. The first one, which is mainly inscriptional evidence, and the second one, which is that of Manichaean texts. Then we will briefly try to discover what is the difference between those texts and why it is relevant, and then come to the main question. What happened in between the two periods of attestation to the Parthian language, and why is it that the attestations happened in completely different regions? Then, as an example of what is going on in the West, we'll talk about the influence that Parthian has had on Armenian, and we'll use that as an example to illustrate what may have happened to Parthian in the West to begin with. And on that basis, I will propose to you what may have happened in the case of Armenian, and thus also in the rest of the Western world, namely that Parthian survived as a spoken language, but not as a main means of communication and thus wasn't attested as much as we would have liked it to be. So, coming to the basics. Parthian is the northern member of the West Middle Iranian languages, uh, with Middle Persian being its southern counterpart. There's some uh, reason to believe that there may have been an untested third dialect or third language, but the evidence for that isn't tremendous. Parthian was one of the key languages of communication and administration of the Parthian Empire, um, but it was also used in other polities, so that is the Kingdom of Iberia or of Armenia, and generally as a lingua franca along the Silk Road. As I've already mentioned, it is attested in two distinct time periods and in two distinct regions, and we may want to wish to inquire why that is. To give you an overview of those two eras, we have one window of attestation that stretches from the middle of the 2nd century BCE to uh, the end of the 3rd century CE, and where our evidence mainly consists of Ostraka from Nisa, so modern Ashrabat in Turkmenistan, uh, east of the Caspian Sea, and other smaller inscriptional evidence from all over the Arsacid territory. Uh, these are mainly personal and often royal inscriptions, either in Parthian, but often in Middle Persian and Parthian, and very few other documents. Our indirect attestation in the contact languages, so the influence that Parthian has had on Armenian and on Georgian, is actually quite good as well, and we can draw many conclusions from this evidence on what has gone, been going on in Parthian in general. The second window of attestation is rather much later, namely from the 6th century to the 13th century CE, and in a completely different region of the world, namely in eastern Turkestan, so in Xinjiang province of the People's Republic of China. The type of material that we gather there is also different. We are not dealing with royal inscriptions anymore or administrative documents, but rather with Manichaean literature, which can be differentiated into early compositions and translations from Aramaic that must have been done close to the life of the prophet Mani, later amalgamations of various bits of this earlier literature, and then later texts which seem to be compromised in the sense that their grammar isn't quite the same as that of the original texts. Now to give you an overview again on a more visual level, on this very simplified map you have in yellow the Silk Road or one of the Silk Road routes and you will see in the black circles the rough regions of attestations of early Parthian material, so the Ostraka and the inscriptions and the letters. 
whilst in the red circle towards the east you have the Turfan region from where almost all the Manichaean material stems. So, why is this so? Why do we have early attestations only in the east, in the core territory of what was the Parthian Empire, and then we find later material only in far more eastern regions? We'll come to that question in just a moment. Before we come to that, we should talk about the differences between those texts. We've mentioned geography, we've mentioned the time periods in which they are attested, and briefly the contents namely sort of royal inscriptions on the one hand, Manichaean religious texts on the other. But there are also several linguistic differences, a small selection of which you find here. The lexicon of Manichaean texts, as may be understandable, is influenced more heavily by Indo-Aryan languages, so for example by Gandhari Prakrit. The morphology over the course of the centuries has changed. We have lost a certain amount of nominal and pronominal morphology, as we'll see in the next slide. And the syntax of the language has changed as well, in many ways, one of which being the loss of ergative alignment in the past tense in favor of nominative alignment. Some of these key differences um, you can see here very briefly summarized. The key being that Parthian and Middle Persian as well have lost almost all of their nominal morphology, but this is more visible in the Manichaean text than it is in the earlier inscriptional evidence. The nominal system in inscriptional evidence, at least on a reconstructed basis and taking into account mainly terms of family relations, can show a difference between oblique in the singular and plural, whilst the direct seems to be unmarked or only optionally marked in both, whilst in later stages there doesn't seem to be any ability to differentiate between those cases on a regular basis. In terms of syntax, as examples one and two show you, we lose the ergative alignment and come to nominative alignment exclusively. In example one, you see that the agent, the first person singular here, is marked by the enclitic pronoun, usually used for the purposes of the oblique, whilst the object occurs in what is the unmarked direct case. And there is no finite verb because a third person singular object has zero agreement. While it's an example two where we would expect zero agreement once more because the complement has a clause counts as a third person singular object, we find agent agreement in the third person plural. So the following questions then arise. Why is it that Parthian is no longer attested in monumental inscriptions past the latest date that we have, so 296 CE. How can we account for this early death of Parthian in the West when it survives for so long in the East? And why are there no significant sources of Parthian writing or similar in the Parthian ruled polities, so that is the Kingdom of Armenia and others? The first question is addressed quite easily. Parthian was the language of the Parthian Empire, and when this empire fell in 224 CE and the Middle Persian-speaking Sasanians rose, uh, Parthian was relegated to second rank. This is especially understandable since those languages are not very dissimilar and may thus have been mutually intelligible. Parthian was still used for a certain period of time as a chancellery language. It was still used in some inscriptions in this time period, um, but it clearly lost importance very quickly. As Durkin Meister and summarizes, since the Sasanians spoke Middle Persian and no Sasanian king left only a Parthian inscription without a Middle Persian version, but even Narse didn't leave any exclusively Middle Persian inscriptions, and since even before the last Parthian inscription, the high priest Kardia had his personal inscription made only in Middle Persian, it seems that Parthian was or at least over time became secondary in this period. The second question, that is, how do we account for its death in the West but its survival in the East, is probably answered best by differentiating very, very clearly between what is attestation and usage. Our attestation of Parthian in pre-Sasanian and even in Sasanian times is, relatively speaking, poor. 
To a certain extent, this is presumably because Parthian was a language with an oral literature, but also because Aramaic was used for inscriptional purposes and almost all of the early Parthian inscriptions are written with Aramaic heterograms. Secondly, we do need to take into account that although the Manichaean literature that we have is attested only from the 6th century onwards, that doesn't mean that it was composed then. Given that Mani lived in the 3rd century CE, it is very likely that most of the literature, at least the earliest layer, must have been composed in that time period. And from there, it was likely spread through Manichaean missionary activity down the Silk Road to the Far East. Why it survived there rather than everywhere else is a question for the historians. Presumably, this had to do something with the adaptability of Manichaeism to other religions and the fervor of those religions, especially in the Sasanian Empire and then later owing to the rise of Islam. So that means that Parthian, in all likelihood, lived on without much attestation well beyond the end of the 3rd century CE, and we simply don't know any more than that. It may very well have been maintained as what we might call a heritage language in the West, and may very well have lived on as a liturgical language of Manichaeism for a considerable number of centuries. And it is in this time span that, in all likelihood, active usage of Parthian would have declined, people would no longer have been L1 speakers of Parthian, which is why we find the grammatical decay that we have seen very briefly earlier on. It is worth remembering that this kind of situation is not uncommon at all, that most cultures, both in the past and in the present, are multilingual, and the situation with which we have to deal in this case simply is one where Parthian was not the dominant language in any one scenario. The third question that we have to deal with, and the one that I want to concentrate on here, is um, why is there no substantial evidence of Parthian in the Arsacid kingdom of Armenia? So, especially during its dynastic rule between 198 and 428 CE. In order to discuss that, we'll have to delve a little more into Armenian history. Armenian as a language, as you know, is an Indo-European language, most closely related probably to Greek, Phrygian and Albanian as the Pontic group. However, it is attested quite late, only in 480 CE with the Sinai inscriptions and manuscript evidence does not predate the middle of the 9th century. For a long time it was considered an Iranian language, uh, but this was disproven by Hübschmann in 1875, who discovered that it was a separate branch of the Indo-European language family, but had undergone severe Iranian influence, and Meyer later on showed that this influence was mainly, but not exclusively, from Parthian, and pervaded a great number of categories, phonology, lexical, relational morphology, and even syntax. Um, just to give you an idea of the extent of this influence, taking into account the lemmata that Hübschmann in his 1897 dictionary analyzed, um, only 22% are of pure Indo-European, or of direct Indo-European heritage, and thus echt Armenisch, whilst more than 30% were borrowed from Parthian, according to Belladi. To give you an idea of the extent of Armenia in the time period that we are interested in, you have a small map here with the Sasanian Empire in purple, Armenia in red, and the Roman province of Armenia Minor in yellow. Armenia, of course, had different extents over time, and in the first century BCE also extended much further into modern-day Turkey, Iraq, and even to the borders of the Holy Land, but what is given here in red is the core Armenian territory. Inevitably, all of what I'm going to tell you is extremely condensed and shortened, so here a ridiculously short history. Armenia was ruled for effectively more than a thousand years by one type of Iranian dynasty or another. There were interruptions where briefly they were ruling themselves or where the Romans came in and ruled them, uh, but for the most part Iranian influence is undeniable both politically and culturally. The most significant period for our purposes is that that begins in 66 CE with the coronation of King Tirdat and ends in 428 CE with the Sasanian-imposed Armenian Marspan. 
It is worth noting also that from 198 CE, the rule over Armenia by the Parthians became a her hereditary dynasty, meaning that we have one long family line of Parthians ruling over Armenia. This is particularly relevant in, in that after the fall of the Parthian Empire, the Arsacids stayed in charge of Armenia and frequently quarreled and fought wars with their Sasanian neighbors. And it is further worth noting that at the beginning of the 4th century CE, all of Armenia was Christianized, and that includes the ruling Parthian dynasty. And this put them at odds, of course, also again with their Sasanian neighbors who were Zoroastrians. As Armenian historiography lets us know, there was frequent intermarriage between Armenian and Iranian noble families, and there was the tutelage or the Dayak system, whereby Armenian youngsters were sent to Iranian families and vice versa, which may very well have resulted in them learning the historical hereditary language of the other. To give you a brief idea of the influence that Parthian has had on Armenian, here you can see a set of loans, uh, just a small example. These loans include not only specialized vocab, but also some of the more basic items and also have branched out into the closed classes of numbers and prepositions. Middle Persian and Old Iranian loans exist as well in Armenian, but they're either very few in number or are restricted to a small lexical field, so for example that of administration or of military. We can also note that Parthian phonemes, especially a number of fricatives, were borrowed into Armenian and have been naturalized there. Parthian influence does not extend only to the lexicon itself, but also to compounding mechanisms. We see here a few examples where either an Armenian word compounded with a Parthian word, for example in Barikam, where Bari is a good Armenian word, or where we have direct calques, where Armenian material is used on the basis of a Parthian pattern, so Tzerbakal on the basis of Dast Grav, both meaning taken by hand, so both containing the word for hand and for taking. But these calques are also very frequent when it comes to complex predicates, so to semantically weak verbs and noun combinations. For our purpose, the most significant part of Parthian influence, however, is that on the syntax of Armenian, where we can see a number of parallelisms that are likely due to what we might call pattern replication. Armenian, for example, has an intensifier inkun, which in classical Armenian is used both to mean sort of self and himself, uh, but is also used as an anaphora and to a lesser extent as a switch function marker. And this is paralleled exactly in Parthian and in Middle Persian by means of the words vachat and khwad. Similarly, Armenian has adopted a canonical reflexive anzenyur, which must be modeled on similar phrases in Parthian, which also exist in other Indo-Iranian languages like Khwish Grief. Another rather unusual parallel between Parthian and Armenian is the use of the complementizer yete, which not only occurs as introducing direct and indirect statements and after verbs of perception, but also just like in Middle Persian and Parthian, introduces indirect WH questions, which is cross-linguistically quite rare and thus suggests that again this is a syntactic borrowing, if you will. The coup de grâce, however, is the Armenian perfect tense, which in early classical Armenian has split tripartite alignment, meaning that in intransitive sentences we find nominative subjects and subject agreement in the verb, whilst in transitive sentences we find genitive agents, accusative objects, and zero agreement in the verb, which is expressed as a fossilized third person singular. This tripartite alignment, through a number of adaptations, is based on the Parthian split ergative past tense. Over time, Armenian, like Parthian, loses this split alignment and moves towards nominative accusative alignments in all tenses. I'm afraid there is no time here to give you examples of all of these particular cases of pattern replication or calking but I refer you to the references given there for more information. And of course, you can always get in touch with questions or suggestions. Now, what does this 
or mean for our purposes? Well, the contact between Armenian and Iranian uh, in general, and Parthian in particular, was clearly very long and also fairly intense, as indicated by the various kinds of influence that Parthian has had on the Armenian language. Particularly, this kind of syntactic influence and the pattern replication that we have seen is common, if not exclusive, to language shift situations. That is, where one language slowly atrophies in favor of another, with the original population of the first atrophying language shifting slowly to another language as its main means of communication. Given the socio-historic setting that we've just mentioned, so the fact that a Parthian Arsacid hereditary dynasty was ruling over Armenia, that they converted to Christianity together with the Armenians, fought wars against the Sasanians with the Armenians, and clearly must have communicated with the Armenians if they intermarried and exchanged wards. This may very well mean that over the course of numerous centuries, the Parthian ruling class of Armenia effectively switched to Armenian as their main, if not exclusive, means of communication. And that is probably one of the reasons why we find so much Armenian literature in Armenian, but no evidence of Parthian, even though the country was ruled by Parthians. Accordingly, this is likely why Parthian, in inverted commas, died in the region. It was not attested simply because there was another dominant language present, but may very well have been spoken still for a long period of time by its hereditary speakers. Arguably, this is not the first shift that has happened in Parthian history. Uh, Henning and Lecoq argue that the Parnians, who may have brought Eastern Iranian vocabulary into Parthian, when they invaded Parthian territory, may very well have shifted from their original language to Parthian as well. And socio-historically, the situation compares quite nicely also to that in Britain after the Norman conquest of 1066 CE, where French speakers were the distinct minority and over the course of the next few centuries, shifted to English as their main means of communication without, however, neglecting to leave their trace on the English language, as is well known. What might this kind of situation look like schematically? If you consider this slide with TL being Armenian and L1 being Parthian, then in phase one we have a situation where both languages are not yet in contact. And then as in phase two the languages approach with, together with the respective cultures and societies, we create what might be called an interlanguage. This can be either the language of bilingual speakers who randomly and happily shift back and forth between Armenian and Parthian as their means of communication and may very well code switch in their daily communication. Or this may constitute the language spoken by adult Parthian speakers who have acquired Armenian secondarily and make the occasional mistake by using Parthian syntax where Armenian works differently. Over time, this means that as the target language, so here Armenian becomes used more, and as the generations move on, we may have L1, that is Parthian semi-speakers, so those who have mainly spoken Armenian for most of their life, but no Parthian, speaking it with Armenian influence, as it were. And by the time of phase four, Armenian has become the most important means of communication, whilst Parthian is maintained only as a heritage language, potentially losing some of its features and being influenced by Armenian or other surrounding languages at the same time. The fact that we lack any data that could corroborate this makes it, of course, very difficult to verify this kind of scenario. But it explains both why Armenian is such a heavily Iranianized language 
and why we find no substantial attestations of Parthian in Armenia or in the rest of the Iranian world shortly after the fall of the Parthian Empire. This notion, however, of Parthian being maintained as a heritage language, but not as a main means of communication, could of course stretch all over the Sasanian Empire, meaning that what we're dealing with is a case of bi- or multilingualism with diglossia. So, for example, that the Parthian population speaks both Parthian and, let's say, Middle Persian, but that Middle Persian is the language they would use externally with everyone else, whilst Parthian is only spoken at home. And as the generations move on, the importance and the ability to speak Parthian becomes less and less. In conclusion, then, Parthian dies multiple times, but only in inverted commas. The death is not necessarily one of usage, but one of attestation. We may surmise that Parthian dies out because other languages have become culturally and politically more important, be that Sasanian, Middle Persian, or Armenian in the Kingdom of Armenia. The fact that it is attested in two different phases, so in an early phase as part of the Parthian Empire, and in a late phase as the liturgical language of Manichaeism, is just as accidental as the regional distribution that we find, with the first phase being restricted to the core territory of the Parthian Empire, and the second one being the Turfan oasis, where all of its documents have been found. So again, here we need to differentiate clearly between usage, for which we have no direct evidence, and attestation, for which we have actual documents. The only way in which we can attest to a certain extent and indirectly that Parthian must have continued to be used for a significant period of time after the fall of the Parthian Empire is its influence on Armenian and other languages, specifically here the unusual influence on Armenian syntax and potentially the resulting language shift of the Parthian ruling class to Armenian as their main means of communication. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions or comments on my presentation, I would be very grateful if you would get in touch with me. My email address is on the first slide of the presentation, but I'll repeat it here robin.meyer at ling-phil.ox.ac.uk. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you soon at the next conference.